Okay. Uh, good morning, everyone. Oh, I hate microphones. Um, I might start to sing. <laughs> uh, so I've taken very seriously the brief this morning to be provocative, so I hope no one minds. So I'll start by asking why there are no women champions speaking today, but I'll leave that there. So rather than um, go through everything we know about the Neolithic of Perth and Kinross, which is much, much more than we know about the Mesolithic, I want to try and make some more high-level observations uh, and more general comments on the process. And these are kind of the main headlines I'm going to be covering. Um, for me, there are various aspects of this that are unsatisfactory as a process. Um, the time period of the Neolithic is a bit constraining, and I think that Matt will also make that point as well. So there are aspects that transcend the boundaries of the time period that can't be adequately um, captured within the research framework process as they traditionally stand. And also, the geographical boundary is, of course, a modern political construct. And so much as I'd love to include Claish, Timber Hall, and Auchin Lake, Long Cairn in my um, document about the Neolithic of the, of the county, I can't because they were only in Perthshire in the 19th century, but now they're in Stirling. So two really significant sites have been taken away from the county, but they are part of the narrative and part of the unusual traditions that we have in the Neolithic of, of this area of Scotland. There's also nothing really particularly distinctive about the Neolithic of Perth and Kinross, but yet there's also something that's um, quite unique about the variety of stuff that's here in terms of the cross-section of material culture, sites, monuments, and traces we have of other activities of Neolithic life. Um, in some ways, it's just a typical Eastern Lowland Neolithic, as perhaps Gordon Barclay and I might have defined it back in the 1990s. But also, um, it's part of other, for instance, megalithic traditions as well. So there's something really interesting going on, which is perhaps something that could be explored in more detail. And it strikes me that there's something really interesting about the way that the the record has developed in Perth and Kinross in relation to the Neolithic. And we've heard a great example of the Mesolithic, because if it wasn't for Dean, then we would only have one Mesolithic site in Perth and Kinross. But because of Dean's tenacious um, risk-taking activities, we've now got three. So individuals and research projects and specific agendas can really shape the way the record forms. And in, in the Neolithic, that's really resulted in a series of biases um, in a certain directions, and I'll, I'll talk about that as we go forward. Uh, and I think also there's huge potential, and uh, some of the kind of potential research questions I'll come back to, but I think that, for instance, if we're going to find a proper upland Neolithic anywhere in Scotland, then Perth and Kinross is probably the place where we're going to be able to identify things that are perhaps so far have been elusive. So it's a county really in terms of the Neolithic of contrasts and perhaps tensions, and I think tensions are important because that's often where the best research and the best thinking comes from. And it's got this kind of lowland, upland character that Gavin's already talked about earlier on with his, his geolog geological background. Um, so we've got a kind of highland bit of the character of the landscape. We've also got the lowlands. So we have the kind of the, the vast swathes of fantastic farmland, which was, were very attractive to the first farmers, and also is, is a great place to find crop marks. But they've also got this, these expansive upland areas where we've got some megalithic monuments and incredible rock art resources. So there's a kind of real, a real nice mixture of topographies that you don't get in some other parts of Scotland, which, are, which, is, which gives it a, a unique character. Oof, the colours didn't work there. Um, we've also got um, a kind of a, a rural and urban distinction as well, which is interesting to me um, because the rural is where, of course, we find a Neolithic, generally, isn't it? But then. Maybe in the urban we have the Neolithic lurking there, and it's being found in developer-funded um, uh, work, for instance, in recent years. So we have this kind of contrast where there are blanks in the map because um, we have Perth there, when there's tons and tons of medieval stuff because every time there's a development, there's lot, Derek Hall finds loads of stuff. Um, but in fact, there's other things going on there as well. So maybe we've got this other kind of rural-urban distinction as well. We've also got this intriguing megalithic, non-megalithic, um, divide going on as well, where we've got uh, an incredible range of earthwork and timber monuments in the Neolithic, but we've also got some really great megalithic monuments that are that are fairly poorly understood, apart from the ones that Margaret Stewart poked about. And so we've got the we've got a really nice range of stuff going on. 
And then maybe looking more broadly, we've also got these kind of interlinking traditions that have got different kind of um, field, uh, networks of influence. So we've got stuff happening that's that's fairly localized, you know, that we only find maybe around here, maybe in other parts of Eastern Lowland Scotland. We've got stuff happening that you find all over the place, grooved wear, um, for instance, traditions, other monumental traditions like construction of palisaded enclosures. Um, and then in cremation practice in the late Neolithic. And then we've got stuff that's got a broader resonances as well. And last night, I don't think Alison shared it and made it in the end. She thought she might make it. Um, but she emailed me last night and told me to mention jadeite axes. And so therefore we have stuff found in the county, Neolithic polished stone axes that are made from material from Northern Italy. So these are kind of broad networks of, of influence that are both localized and national and international and they're using a modern political terminology. Chronology is a problem, and Dean's highlighted one of those problems already, I think, um, that, you know, when, when, you know, when do we actually define this boundary, this cutoff point of the start of the Neolithic? Uh, because we don't have a late Mesolithic, then, we, then we're missing part of the story. One of the, the advantages the National Scarf Framework had was that we were able to kind of fill in the, the, the late Mesolithic side of things because we had that, whereas we don't really have it in Perth and Kinross, so we're going to have a one-sided conversation when it comes to thinking about how the Neolithic emerged, which is a bit of a problem. And then, and, and Matt will, will talk about this as well, um, is about this kind of more broad issue of the third millennium uh, and how do we deal with that and how do we manage that? You know, when did the, you know, when did, we, when did the Neolithic end? Does that really matter? Is this a concept that really is helpful anymore in thinking, thinking what happened in the third millennium? Um, or should we be trying to get beyond these period definitions to think about, you know, what's going on with things that continue to um, be done throughout the third millennium, stuff that stops around the middle, things that emerge. You know, for instance, there are, you know, in my document, that I've, um, my kind of um, rough rambling document that I sent Gavin last week, weeks after the deadline, no, days after the deadline, wasn't too bad. I don't, I don't mention henges, because I don't think any henge in Perth and Kinross is Neolithic. So, um, because these are all structures that are Chalcolithic or early Bronze Age, but all of the henges have got stuff inside them that is Neolithic. Timber circles, timber structures, other bits of activity, pit digging and so on. So how do we manage sites like that that straddle this boundary? You know, and how do we start to kind of rethink our research parameters when we start to say, well, actually, I'm going to talk about the Neolithic of Perth and Kinross and I'm not going to mention henges. You know, I can see there are people fainting at the shock of that concept. And then also, we've got um, big issues being played out just now in, our, uh, in research looking at ADNA, isotopic analysis, mobility, and uh, the identity and even ethnicity of uh, of uh, the first farmers in Britain, and also the, the beaker folk, as they now, they now appear to be re have a resurgence in recent years. Um, and how does Perth and Kinross feed into those wider debates? Now, I've talked about historiography and bias, um, and we've got this kind of really rich tradition of people who have done great work in Perth and Kinross. Um, we've got a lot of antiquarian poking about, of course, um, Gordon Child had a wee dig at, uh, at Kondrocket in the 1930s when, uh, with Margaret Stewart, who was his student. Uh, and then the 60s was an interesting campaign of digs by a kind of combination of Coles and or Simpson and or Piggott at various different sites, including Pitney Cree uh, and Croft Morig, which subsequently became another one of these Neolithic sites that turned out to be Bronze Age. Um, and then we had this kind of really fantastic um, campaign by Margaret Stewart, um, a very much community archaeology focus, um, looking at a range of sites from chambered cairns to four post settings, often in Strath Tay, to, uh, to sites like Moncrief. Again, one of these henges which turns out to not be Neolithic. Uh, and so her dynamic work shaped a lot of the agenda for this county, and some of the sites that are well known are ones that she investigated. Oof, Gordon Barclay, who sadly can't be here today because if he'd been here, I wouldn't have put that picture of him up because he wouldn't like it. Um, so I've actually got a good picture of Gordon coming out of a portaloo on an excavation we did years ago, which he he's swore me never to use in public. So Gordon, um, personally, is, is, a, is a giant figure in Scottish Neolithic studies, and his personal kind of interest and in campaign of excavations, in particular crop mark sites in the 90s and 2000s, really shaped a lot of our understanding of the Neolithic of Perth and Kinross. But that goes right back to these amazing excavations at North Mains in the late 70s. Again, a site which ostensibly should have been Neolithic, but turned out to be almost wholly Bronze Age or Chalcolithic. 
apart from the kind of the big timber circle that was inside the North Mains Henge. So again, his his interest in Neolithic monumentality and crop mark sites has shaped a lot of the way that we understand the Neolithic of the county. And then from that, then I've done the excavations here on the SERF project that we, um, that Dean and I have both been involved in since 2006. Has again focused in the terms of the prehistoric part of the project largely on, uh, or the Neolithic and Bronze Age stuff has largely been lowland crop mark complexes. So we've got this kind of dynamic where we go from a kind of a megalithic um, strath um, um, and it focus from the 60s and 70s into a kind of a crop mark lowland monument focus in the, in the 80s and 90s and 2000s. And this is really what's shaping the way we see the Neolithic now. And then into the mix, we should add into that also developer funded stuff, which offers a kind of a random sample into the landscape. And to show that I actually do sometimes have a grasp of figures. Um, if you look at, um, for instance, the period between 1985 and, and 2015, there were 34 excavations of Neolithic sites in Perth and Kinross, according to uh, Discovery and Excavation in Scotland. Um, and that was um, of about 20 sites or something like that, 20 odd sites. So 20 of those excavations were research excavations in that period, which is quite a, um, for, for, a for a sort of a mainland Scottish county, that's actually quite an unusual preponderance. But if you actually look into that in more detail, almost all of those excavations are, are me, Gordon Barclay, the SERF project, and one or two other things like Ben Laws. So this, is, this, this dynamic has been shaped by a few individuals and their research interests. And then if you look at the 14 seasons of developer funded work at various different scales and levels, this has been driven, of course, by all sorts of things like development, schools being built, the Bewley to Denny power line, um, pipelines and so on, uh, the, uh, the new high school in Creef, et cetera, et cetera. And then you've got um, the uh, kind of a more random sample. But almost all of this work's been focused on the lowlands. And again, this is partly because of research biases and partly because of the nature of developer funded archaeology. So we have to think about the Neolithic, as we see in Perth and Kinross, as being the product of a series of individuals and strategic decisions and infrastructure um, needs of society that are then fulfilled by construction projects that then fund archaeology. So it's a quite a complicated mix. And I think that it's something we should be doing as part of this research framework is to think about how the record is created, what biases this has established, and how can we maybe, going forward, um, address those in various different ways. Now, Perth and Kinross has got, um, has got something that really is, um, for me, as innovative and distinctive, and it's RCAM's 1994. Is that right, Becky? 1994? Southeast Perth, yeah, that's, yeah. Yeah, because Northeast Perth, <laughs> That's all upland stuff. South East Perth um, is an incredible book published by the old Royal Commission back in the day because it, has a, it, because it covers the archaeology of this bit of Perth and it takes crop marks seriously. It actually looks at crop mark sites and treats them like archaeological sites, interprets them and adds them into a narrative of what we understand about the past. And it's full of crop marks and it's full of really nice interpretation. Admittedly, it's mostly lowland stuff. Again, repeating this kind of bias I've heard about already, but it's really significant um, and it's a very important book. Uh, and we could do with this kind of coverage in other parts of Scotland as well. And it could be updated now with lots of excavation stuff, of course, because it's been a, it's kind of been a bit of a, I've been able to cherry pick stuff from that and excavate it over the years, essentially. Um, like Carsey Mains, which is a site that Gordon and I dug in 2002. But crop marks are a, they're a huge resource in Perth and Kinross and something that every period of the research framework should be interested in. Um, but there's lots of unknowns and problems with the crop mark record. So just for instance, there are 340 um, sites in Canmore that are in Perth and Kinross that as part of their site classification have the word crop mark or crop marks, usually with something like period unknown. So therefore, there are 340 sites that have got bits of them that show up as crop marks, but they're not really quite clear what those crop marks mean. They might just be blobs. They might be squiggles. They might be weird shapes that don't make any sense. But these are potentially sites that might make sense in some context if we look at the crop marks in more detail or maybe return to these sites with other strategies like geophysics or field walking. There are 391 crop mark sites in Perth and Kinross which have, as part of the classification, enclosure period unassigned. That's 391 sites that could be, theoretically, of any period. Maybe they're all Iron Age settlement sites. You know, maybe, maybe some of them are Roman temporary camps that no one spotted, unlikely. But some of them could be Neolithic enclosures, 
They could be things like causeway enclosures, which is one of the things that we're still not quite getting to in Perth and Can Ross. So there's a lot of crop mark sites out there that could do with being revisited. And I could have played this game with all sorts of other classifications like um, curvilinear, a ditch, period unassigned, et cetera, et cetera. Linear crop marks, pit alignments, lots of stuff that we just can't quite pin down what period it belongs to. So there's a, there's a big crop mark analysis project that could be done here. Um, but that you could say the same for every place in Scotland, and you could say the same for every period of the research framework. So what we have is this sort of Eastern Lowland Neolithic, um, where we've got, which is kind of something that Gordon Barr and I sort of tried to define uh, through our work in the 90s onwards, um, when before he lost interest in the Neolithic. Um, and, and we have this kind of preponderance of timber and earthwork monuments and enclosures, um, a burial record with a few long barrows, quite a lot of probably mortuary enclosures and other timber non-megalithic structures that show up as crop marks. Um, set on record dominated by pits and pit clusters with almost no real evidence for early Neolithic buildings or structures. Um, but we would expect there to be uh, light rectangular timber structures and buildings. Um, quite a few four-poster late Neolithic grooved ware related high status houses. Um, as they are sometimes discussed in the literature of um, by Julian Thomas and Richard Bradley. Uh, and timber halls, if you include Clash, let's just imagine that Clash is still in Perth and Kinross. Um, and also there's quite a few good crop mark examples that stand up as being quite similar. Uh, and then I'll come back to material culture in a minute because it's all a bit embarrassing. So we've got an Eastern Lowland Neolithic, but then we've also got this incredible upland character as well of the landscape. So we've got um, uh, with the Ben Laws Landscape Project, found, you know, for instance, Neolithic, uh, kind of preserved Neolithic woodland. Um, there's been loads of rock art looked up there. The chronology is still not unclear. I've, I've got rock art in my document. Matt hasn't included it in his, but it's probably something that runs through the whole of the third millennium. We've got an axe factory. That's a distinctive thing for Scotland so far. Um, up top, you know, so that's a, a very significant site, you know, in the Ben Laws Landscape. We've got probable upland uh, Neolithic um, uh, upland Neolithic enclosures. Can I talk about this, Tessa? Is that okay? Yeah, thank you. So Dunnock, um, which is a crop mark hilltop enclosure at Dunning, um, was excavated a bit by garden, a bit by um, the, uh, the surf project over the over the last decade or so, and the outer ditch. Is that right? Ditch four. Ditch four has got. Produce radiocarbon dates from the Neolithic and also a complete um, a complete carinated bowl pot from the ditch. So the outer ditch of the Dunnock site is a Neolithic enclosure. So how many other upland enclosures and upland um, forts in the county and elsewhere have actually got a Neolithic thing lurking underneath? So I think that there's there's potentially an upland Neolithic we're just not quite seeing, but it could be there in the crop mark and also on the upstanding record. And then if you look at sites like Carn Do, which is excavated thing by Jim Ride out back in the day a site that's got a lot of later prehistoric nonsense going on. Amongst that was also found evidence for potentially for Neolithic farming in an upland context. And Dean has found potential um, Neolithic ard marks uh, at Well Hill next to, his, next to his Mesolithic pit alignment. And there's also some good evidence for farming at places like North Mains and Pitna Cree under the mounds as well. So we've got potentially in these upland locations like Carn Do, where you've got these later prehistoric settlements We've also maybe got Neolithic stuff happening there as well. There's no reason why there wasn't Neolithic farming, settlement, transhumans, camping, whatever you want to describe it happening up there at the same time. There's a massive potential to find that upland, that upland Neolithic. Now, material culture, you shouldn't have asked me about this. I'm not a material culture person, so you know, if you want someone to kind of give you the breakdown of how much groove wear we've got here, what the impress wear situation is, how many polished stone axes have been found in the county? Well, I suppose I could find that through Canmore and just do a wee search, but um, then I'm not the person to ask. So my perception is that the material culture in the Neolithic of Perth and Can Ross is pretty standard for other parts of um, eastern um, lowland Scotland, maybe even eastern, eastern Britain in some respects. But I don't really know where those gaps are and what the opportunities and potential are. So you know that's where you need your Allisons and your Trevors and people like that who can really fill in those gaps. So it's important in this process in the research framework that the champions can do so much, but that other people need to feed into this as well. Otherwise, there's going to be a partial picture. I can provide the bare statistics, but I don't necessarily have the expertise to cover all of this stuff. Sorry, Gavin. How long have we left? Three minutes? Jeez. So, knowledge gaps. <laughs> yeah. So I've kind of talked about these really already um, in terms of transitions and 
the upland Neolithic, not really me understood. Um, not really having many houses. Um, well, the environment context is clearly not something we need to do more work on. That seems like to be a big focus going forward. Um, we don't have a lot of late Neolithic burial evidence, you know, apart from a few cremation cemeteries like for Tevia. So what's happening in the late Neolithic? Um, rock art is something that's not part of these broader narratives. And we're talking about the Neolithic of Perth and Ross rock art that isn't part of the story. Um, and we know that that's something that can be, more can be done with that through excavations like the stuff that was done by um, Bradley and Watson at Ben Laws. Um, and I've got some research priorities. I'm going to, you can look at these, the document will available at some point. Okay, it's kind of stuff I've talked about already. I just want to make a few final points just before I get shut down here. Um, this, is, this is my version of the Neolithic. This is what I think about it. Um, and it can't just be about me. It can't just be about my narrow interest. It has to be about what other people want to do as well. So this process will only work if other people feed in and, and let us know what they think the issues are, what, what our knowledge gaps are, what the priorities going forward are. Because otherwise, it just becomes me writing my own funding applications for the future. So it has to be a kind of process that's more democratic than that. And, we have to, and I, you have to think about, you know, why are we doing this? We've already heard the you know, kind of overall objectives this morning, but what is the point of this process? Um, why are we doing this? Who is it for? Who benefits from this process? Uh, is it just us? Is it just archaeologists? Is it the commercial sector? Is it academics? Is it PACARF? Um, is it HESS? Uh, or it should be more broad than that. You Should it be everyone who lives in the county that benefits or everyone who's interested in the county? Um, how, can we, how can we make sure this process is something that's meaningful for as many people as possible? And how can we get as many people involved, involved as possible in this process as well? And what's the end point? Um, so for me, I'm sorry to say this, but for me, the, the SCARF national document is a, bit of a, is a bit of a dinosaur. It's this kind of giant frozen PDF or a web page that doesn't really do anything or change. And that was never what I thought the process was about. How can we make this framework for Perth and Can Ross into a living, useful document that actually, makes, that actually people can use and update and make sense of and navigate around in a kind of more, um, in, a, in, a, in a way that's more kind of, not, not as linear, a bit more kind of intuitive. Um, what's the final outcome? What's this going to look like? I know this is beyond my brief to do this and um, to think about that, but you know, it's something that really troubles me about research framework processes. Um, and I think also, why don't we have a why don't we have a champion for the third millennium? Why do we have a Neolithic champion and a Bronze Age Chalco champion? Why not have a Mesolithic early Neolithic champion, a third millennium champion? Uh, rest of the Bronze Age and into the Iron Age champion and so on. You know, do we really have to do things this way? Why, after we finish these talks, are we literally ha literally having the Neolithic and the Bronze Age people in different rooms? Because there's people in both those rooms who contribute to each other's panels. So, you know, is this really the best way to do this? I'm being provocative now, sorry. So, <laughs> you know, maybe part of this process should be about thinking about, are these actually the right ways to organize and structure what we're doing going forward? Yeah, is it? Oh, that's what you said that really already. And how can we involve as many people as possible? Yeah, and I think that this should be a, more broadly about the community, you know, and it shouldn't just be a framework for archaeologists, but it should be a framework for everyone. So how do we get as many people as involved as possible? How do we consult as many people as possible? How do we find out what people who live in Perth and Kinross want, value about their heritage, both in the Neolithic and other periods as well? And how do we make sure that's reflected in this document? Because that's the only way it's actually going to go forward as being a living, workable document for people who live here. Thank you.